This first unit sets the foundation for the rest of the class. You will examine the Earth as a system of interdependent components, processes, and relationships. You'll look at the distribution of terrestrial and aquatic biomes. You'll learn about biogeochemical cycles and how important elements cycle through the environment. You'll learn about how energy and matter cycle through ecosystems and how those cycles are altered by human activities. As you watch and follow along with your notes, please pause the video when you need to so you can fill in the appropriate responses in your notes. Living things are studied at a few different levels of organization. In environmental science, we mainly focus on the last few levels you see on the chart. An organism is an individual living thing. A population is a group of organisms of the same species that live in the same area. A community is composed of different populations that live together in a defined area. And finally, an ecosystem is a community and its non-living or abiotic surroundings. You may hear the term biome used interchangeably with ecosystems. A biome is a geographic distribution of areas that each have a specific environmental feature based on their shared climate. However, an ecosystem is a little bit more specific. It's a specific area that's part of a biome, but a bit more regional. Here's an example, right? An example of a biome is a savanna. An example of an ecosystem might be the oak savanna at Labaw Woods in Chicago, Illinois. Let's take a look at things that go into an ecosystem. Ecosystems are the result of biotic and abiotic interactions. Biotic meaning the living components and abiotic meaning the non-living components like soil, water, and the topography of the area. We'll look at the abiotic components a little bit later in this video, but let's begin with the living part. Here's the ways that living things can interact with each other. A predator-prey relationship is where a predator organism eats another organism, the prey. Competition can occur within or between species in an area where resources such as food, shelter, and mates are limited. Now, organisms have come up with impressive ways to reduce competition. Resource partitioning, or niche partitioning, is using resources in different ways, places, or at different times to reduce the negative impact of competition on survival and reproduction. All these warblers use a spruce tree as one of their primary resources, but to avoid competition, they partition it and have specialized in surviving, seeking shelter, and looking for food in specific parts of the tree. On the diagram, we can see that the Cape May warbler specializes in utilizing the resources at the top of the tree. Meanwhile, the yellow rumped warbler specializes in finding food and habitat on the forest floor and near the bottom branches. Actually, the diagram shows a large variety of ways a single resource can be shared amongst multiple different species. There are a few more ways that organisms interact with each other, and we actually group these under a specific category called symbiosis. Symbiosis is a close and long-term interaction between two species in an ecosystem, and these are relationships that have co-evolved over millions of years. Mutualism is when two species both benefit from an interaction. Commensalism is where one species benefits from a particular interaction, but the other is completely unaffected. Parasitism is when one organism benefits at the expense of another. However, please do not mistake parasitism for predation. Parasites generally rely on their host and would prefer if they don't die. Meanwhile, predators literally actively consume a prey animal as a source of energy. A biome contains characteristic communities of plants and animals that result from and are adapted to a particular climate. Now, climate is one of the abiotic components of an ecosystem, and climate refers to the pattern of rainfall and temperature in an area, commonly represented using a climatogram. In these diagrams, temperature is typically represented by a line and precipitation as bars. Notice how in the deciduous forest biome, the temperature tends to be very cold in the winter and relatively hot in the summer. 
While the deciduous forest does get some amount of rain and precipitation all year round, you would expect to see the most rain during the spring and fall. The nine major terrestrial biomes that you will become familiar with in no particular order are the taiga, the temperate rainforest, the temperate seasonal forest, sometimes called the deciduous forest, the tropical rainforest, the shrubland, sometimes also called the chaparral, the temperate grassland, savanna, desert, and tundra. The distinctions between a biome are actually not so cut and dry. Notice on this diagram the wide spectrum of precipitation and temperature patterns that are typical of any biome. A deciduous forest can exist in an area that gets as little as 100 centimeters of rain, all the way up to an area that gets 250 centimeters of rain, and it can exist within a wide range of average temperatures. This map shows the general distribution of biomes across the globe. The astute observer will notice a pattern. Tropical rainforests tend to be clustered near the equator, deserts around the 30 degree north and 30 degree south line, and tundras in the far polar regions. This is because, geographically speaking, an area's climate is broadly influenced by two major things. Latitude, or how far away from the equator you are, and elevation, how high above sea level you are. Near the equator, you have plenty of sunlight and warm year-round temperatures. The farther you go north or south, you get more seasonal climates. Elevation also matters. The higher in elevation, the cooler it tends to be. This is why, here in South America, even though you're at the equator and expecting warm temperatures, this map tells me I'm at a tundra? Yeah, these are the Andes Mountains, and at these high elevations, the fact that you're near the equator is almost irrelevant. The low air density this high up means it's going to be cold. And as a preview of a future unit, climate is much more than just elevation and latitude. All these things we'll learn about when we hit Unit 4. All the things we just talked about are terrestrial biomes. Scientists have classifications for aquatic biomes as well, but those aren't particularly geographically bound in any specific way. Rather, they're defined by salinity, depth, and the characteristic biotic communities in that body of water. There are two main categories for aquatic biomes, freshwater and saltwater, or marine biomes. The freshwater biomes include streams, rivers, ponds, and lakes. Freshwater biomes are super important to us because they're an important source of drinking water. The marine biomes include oceans, coral reef, marshlands, and estuaries. Algae in these ecosystems supply the majority of the Earth's breathable oxygen and absorb a significant amount of carbon dioxide, so marine biomes are also important to us. But all of that wraps up our first video, and if you want a more detailed look at biomes and climate, check out the deep dive videos linked in the description. But for now, go explore the outside.